It's time for Total Connection Worship Hour and Victorious Living Institute. Join Bishop Seth Olardi and the Commission for Global Ministries, along with 400 Year Celebration Incorporated. For dynamic worship, uplifting praise, and dynamic preaching from Bishop Seth Olardi and other powerful and anointed ministers of the gospel. Join us right now for this dynamic experience. We will continue trusting God for his goodness and for his mercy. Let me just revisit the text that uh, was shared with us this afternoon, taken from the book of Colossians. This is Paul's letter to the Colossians uh, at a time when they were experiencing some great controversies about the faith. And one of the things I like to, you know, just applaud uh, Alpha and Omega about is that uh, they're not wasting time to sit around and talk about, you know, uh, what's happening with theology, what happening with doctrine, when people are actually out there hungry. People need to see the hand of God, the, the, the feet of God, the, the eyes of God, the, the touch of God. And so whenever the church is preoccupied with uh, doctrinal issues and we are preoccupied with uh, what the right polity is, the rest of it, the world is dying. And uh, this is what was happening uh, in the book of Colossians and others. And so Paul here addresses something that has to do with the home. As you know, uh, one of these days we'll you know, spend some time just focusing on the home because I believe that the home is God's elementary school, is God's uh, middle school, preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school. The home is God's educational framework. And whenever the home is not what it ought to be with the best kind of teachers and principals and, and, and all of the workers, it breaks down. Uh, the more I look at what's happening to society today, the more I'm convinced that we are simply dealing with symptoms when the real cause is at the home level. Just imagine with all of what they're trying to do when it comes to climate change, when it comes to violence and all of these things that are happening in our world, in our communities, I guarantee you if we were to go back to God's original classroom, which is the home, you will see dramatic change occurring in society. In the book of Colossians, beginning at verse 20, the apostle Paul said these words, children, always obey your parents. That's a tough, tough command. But remember now, he's talking about believers, people who trust God. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Then he says, fathers, do not provoke, do not aggravate, do not make your children angry, or they will become discouraged. It is from that particular text today, we want to continue the series talking about fatherhood, the hope for a godly future. In the month of June, we are going to be announcing a major, major fatherhood initiative. <clears throat> and it has come out of these series of messages that uh, we've been preaching, uh, teaching and sharing with you, and uh, uh, it saddens my heart that this great nation called America, with all of its military powers and democratic whatever, it is the world's leading nation with the highest number of fatherless homes. So just imagine what will happen if all institutions, the church, the civic, Everybody, if we all turn our attention to ensuring that the home is once again staffed 
with the right kind of leadership. Fathers, we want to thank the mothers for, oh, you've been there. You, you, no wonder God call you female. No wonder you are a uh, woman. Uh, you have both a war and a man going on. And so when the people leave, you still carry on. We thank God for what he's done for you. So we want to talk today from the subject, do not provoke your children to anger. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That word provoke means to agitate, means to anger, means to enrage, means to stir up a kind of emotion. It, it means to arouse. It means to evoke a type of a negative feelings in your child that will make your child not only discouraged, but angry with you. Sometimes children will rather leave the home and go out to be with others versus being at home uh, because of the aggravation, because of the anger that is often stirred up when they are at home. And so our text is saying to us, do not provoke your children because you could cause them to become discouraged. To be discouraged is a very sad, sad place to be. Because when you are discouraged, discouraged means you are deprived of hope. When you are discouraged, you are deprived of courage. When you are discouraged, you are deprived of confidence. And no matter whether you do not have money in your pocket, no matter whether you do not have degrees to hang on your wall, no matter what the situation may be, if you have hope, if you have courage, if you have confidence, it can and will make the difference in your life. Imagine living without hope. Imagine living without courage. Imagine living without confidence. Oftentimes when these things are gone out of your life, that's why some people choose to commit suicide because there is no hope, no courage, no confidence. These are ingredients that can propel you to the accomplishment of your dreams, to the accomplishment of your purpose for living. If you have courage, if you have hope, if you have confidence, I'm telling you, every morning you will wake up and look out of your window and declare, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Even if you don't have a job, even if you don't have food on your table, but the fact that he woke you up and you can recognize because the word of God says that everything that have breath must praise the Lord. When you are discouraged, it means you have no hope, no courage, no confidence. There is a gentleman by the name of Victor Frankl, Dr. Victor Frankl. Dr. Brick, Victor Frankl was uh, uh, a Jew that was uh, arrested uh, during uh, the German uh, extermination process. And accordingly, Dr. Frankl was taken from one concentration camp to the next. Actually, he was taken to three different concentration camps. In the process, his wife died. In the process, his mother died. In the process, his father died. In the process, even his sister died. Every person that was close to him that meant anything to him died. Victor Frankl stayed in concentration camp for some three years. And at the end of those three years, when he was released from the concentration camp, he was asked the question, Dr. Victor Frankl, how were you able to manage surviving three different concentration camps? 
one word he gave, hope. I did not allow hope to dissipate. I did not allow discouragement to take over. I never gave up hoping that one day a change was going to come. I never gave up that one day something was going to happen for me to turn my life around. So hope is the expectation that something good is going to happen to you. You may be going through a dark valley right now, but something good is going to happen for you. You may be going through a difficult period in your life, but if you hold on and believe that something good is going to happen for you, it's going to happen by the grace of God. Hope. When you are discouraged, there's no hope. There is no courage. Courage is another ingredient that can propel you to the accomplishment of your dream. It is said that in 1971, a little girl by the name of Julianne and her mother were traveling from Peru to the Amazon forest to see uh, her husband and her father who in fact uh, was a researcher in the Amazon. And as they were traveling, the plane crashed and went down. 92 persons on that flight died, except for little 17 year old Julianne, she survived. And when she came to herself and realized that she was still alive, she had found a candy jar. And according to the story, for 10 days and for 10 nights, Julian walked that Amazon forest. And the only thing that she had going for her was the courage developed by what her father said to her. And the father said, if you follow the stream that is going down, the, the, the going downstream will take you to a civilization. And for 10 days and 10 nights, Lord Julian, 17 years old, avoiding crocodile and the piranha and all of these wild animals, the courage to know that if I continue going downstream, I'll get to civilization. And sure enough, sure enough, she made it. But it was all because of what her father had told her not criticizing her, not telling her what she couldn't do, but told her that she could do it, she could make it. And if she just was to find any time you're going in the forest and you want to find your way, find a stream. And if it is going down, follow that and it would take you to civilization. But when we criticize our loved ones, when we find everything negative about them, it is easy for them to become discouraged. And so the apostle Paul says to fathers, fathers, do not enrage your children. Do not provoke your children. Oh, find something good about them and celebrate them. Because when you celebrate them, when you encourage them, you engender in them, you develop in them hope, courage, and confidence. I'm telling you, confidence, if you have it, it can make you do some things that the world will be shocked. If you recall, it was on February the 10th. Those of you who were looking at the television at that time, on February the 10th, 2007, a young man who was junior senator from Illinois, a young man who was not even considered to be, quote unquote, a Eurocentric American, a young man whose father came from Kenya, and his mother came from Kansas. And God in his wise providence brought those two together to give birth to a Barack Obama. On February 10, 2007, stood and said at the age of 47, I declare my candidacy for the presidency of the United States of America. At age 47, with confidence, he said those words, and sure enough, he became 
And even when those would say he would become a one-term president, he became two-term and today one of America's most popular presidents around the world. Why? He had confidence. Fathers, fathers, fathers. The word says, do not provoke your children to anger or else you make them discouraged. Let me say to all of us fathers, even mothers, regardless of how old our children may be, regardless of what positions they hold in society, no matter what kind of accolades the world have given to them, our children still are craving for our approval, our encouragement, and our emotional support. They may not show it, they may not act like it, but deep down within, they are craving for your support, craving for your encouragement, craving for your approval of their lives. So I said to all of us today, rather than pushing our children away because of continuous criticism, and I know we want our children to do well. I know we don't want them to bring us any kind of embarrassment, but we cannot make that happen by continuously criticizing them, criticizing them for their hairdo, the kind of haircut, criticizing them for this, criticizing them for that, criticizing them for the other. Very, very soon, those children will rather go and listen to even a dog bark than to hang around you because they know around you is nothing but criticism. Today, how fixed we are on the dress code. You know, you look at our children today, the more ragged the pants, the more susceptible and acceptable it is to them. The more loosely dressed. And, and I know as parents, it, it has to bother us. And, and that's because the age out of which we came, you didn't dress like that. The age out of which we were developed or raised, you, you didn't dress like that. But we, we are in a different kind of a climate, a different kind of environment. When you see billionaires getting on television with just a t-shirt on, what kind of message is that to our children? If you remember yesteryears, you didn't have people with wealth and means dressing like that. But today is just the opposite. But let us not get so caught up in the dress code and forget who these children are. Yes, they may have regular pants on, but they're still the image of God. They may have loosely dressed pants that you can even see their undergarment, but they're still the image of God. Let's be careful how we criticize them. Let's be careful how we provoke them based upon our thinking. Instead, my brothers and my sisters, let us work to encourage our children. Let us work to edify them. Let us do whatever we can to find something positive about them. They may have 30 different things that are going wrong. Is there one thing that is going right in their life? Let's find the positive and accentuate the positive. Let us accentuate. And I want to say to you, even that child may not be your biological child. That child may not even be anyone close to your own culture. But if you can encourage that child, oh, I've seen white children gravitate to black men because in the black man's heart, they found love. And I've seen it vice versa because love is a powerful force. And when we celebrate our children, when we lift them up, it makes a difference in their life. No matter what you do, what you say, those children are a reflection of you. As I was thinking about this message today, I was asking myself, could it be that some of what our children are doing are some of the genes in us that we did when we were their age? No one was around to see it, 
but could they be mimicking without even realizing it some of what we were all about? I want to say to all of us to remember and appreciate the fact that children are a blessing from the Lord. In the book of Psalm 127 and verse 3 tells us that children are a blessing from the Lord. Why? Because the truth is there are some people, they have all the wealth in the world. They have every means to support their child from the cradle to the grave. But they do not have the capacity and the ability to bring forth a child. So I want to say to us today, when God blesses you and causes you to bring forth a child into the world, oh, make the best of that child. Oh, encourage that child. Yes, give confidence. Give hope to that child. Because guess what? If you encourage that child, if you edify that child, if you let that child know that you can become whatever it is you put your heart to do, if God be for you, who can be against you? If you can encourage that child, you can find yourself creating on your hands a precedent. You'll find yourself with a Supreme Court justice. You'll find yourself a poet on your hands. You'll find yourself an athlete that will bring pride to the family. You may find yourself the world's best doctor, all because you encourage that child, you edify that child, you give that child the hope that you can make it. Yes, you can. Yes. You name it, that child can become when you provide hope, when you provide confidence, and you provide courage. You know, Jesus said something interesting. Jesus said something about salt. You know salt. Sometimes I'm in the restaurant and I watch people come to eat. They haven't even tasted the food. And the first thing they do, grab the salt shaker and start shaking it on the food. I said, wow. But Jesus talked about the salt. What did Jesus say about the salt? Jesus said, you and I are the salt of the earth. But he also said, be careful. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, he said, be careful. Because if the salt loses its savor, savor means taste. Savor means to smell it. If the salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Salt season things. Salt is a preservative. In some situation, people use salt even to heal some wounds. In ancient times, between the Phoenicians and, and other Asian groups, salt was used as a commodity. Oh yes, yeah, salt, very, very important means of commerce in the yesteryears. But guess what? It is possible that salt can lose its essence. And Jesus said it is possible. What am I saying to you? We know that fatherhood is a very important element in the home. We know that fatherhood can make the difference. The research shows that when there's a man around and a father in the life of a child, it is possible for that child to stay in school. It is said that if there is a father around, it is possible that child will not drop out of school. That child will grow up to do all that he or she can to be the very best that they can become if a father is around. But conversely, what good is a father who's around, but all he does is to criticize is to find something bad to say about the child, something negative to say about the child. Yes, when you are around, but you do not show compassion, love, and support, and all you do is to give destructive kind of a verbalization, it is possible that your presence will be just as Jesus said, salt that have lost its savor. Salt that is no longer good. I want to say to us today, you may not be a father, or you may be a father, 
but let's tell the generation to come, especially the men, be kind to your children. Do not provoke them to anger. Be kind, speak positively to them. Show them courage. Show them people who made it because they had hope. We may never ever have a Rolls Royce or a mansion to give to them, but I'm telling you, if we instill, if we inject into them hope, confidence and courage, they will make it when we are lying somewhere under some grave with a storm storm on top of us, they will be able to still make it because somebody told them, yes, you can. You can make it. With God, all things are possible. With God, nothing is too hard. I'm trying to encourage us today. Never let us become the best critics of our children. They tell me nowhere in the world you'll find a monument built to a critic. Nowhere. And so I said to us this afternoon, if we are going to make fatherhood the hope for a godly future, we must encourage fathers today, speak positively to your children. You say, well, doc, you don't understand. That, that boy is so bad. I'm, I never will understand. They may be bad, but is there any good in that child? They tell me in the best of us, there's some rascality in us. And in the worst of us, you can find something good. That's what happened with the Good Samaritan. Who would have expected that the Good Samaritan would stop and be the one to help someone beaten upside the road? The priest came and didn't help. A Levi came and didn't help. But it was a Levi who was hated, who was not regarded as a part of the clan, who stopped by to help the situation is the Good Samaritan did it in the name of Jesus. I want to encourage us today, fathers and fathers-to-be, let us not provoke our children to anger. The Apostle Paul said, by provoking them, it can cause them to become discouraged. And when they are discouraged, it means they are deprived of hope. They are deprived of courage. They are deprived of confidence. And when you do not have hope, when you do not have confidence, when you do not have courage, I'm telling you, you may as well take flight to another planet. Because on this earth where we are, it takes hope. As the hymn writer said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It takes courage. My brothers and my sisters, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It takes confidence like the apostle Paul when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let us not provoke our children to anger because provoking them could cause them to be discouraged. What do we do? to provoke our children to anger. I shared this with you and then we'll be through. The first is double standards. Double standards. When you have children, it's important that you treat all of them with the same standards. Why? Because you may not always be around to see them interplay and interact with one another. And when you are not around, it is very possible for your children to take it out on the other because of the way you treated that one differently than the rest of them. In the book of Genesis, the 37th chapter, verse 3, it talks about Jacob. Jacob had all these children, but it says he loved Joseph more than all of his sons. And because of that, not only he loved the young man, but he even went overboard and made the young man a beautiful coat. His brothers didn't like it. And what did they do? They took it out on him. They sold him into slavery. But thanks be to God, 
when God is for you, no matter what folk do to you, God will make a way for you. But the essence of the point is this. It all emanated from the fact that the father showed double standards when it came to Joseph and the rest of the children. If you want to provoke your children, start to gravitate to one much more than the other, and you are setting yourself up for a serious problem. The second thing that you don't want to do is to compare your children with others. To compare your children with others. Why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like that person? Why can't you be like the other? Listen, none of us, there's some 8 billion people on the planet and none of us are the same. We are all different. We all have our own genetic code. We all have our path in life we are traveling. We all have different dimensions of accomplishment in our lives. None of us are the same. No matter how well the other child is doing, take time to know this child because this child might be a fast learner or a slow learner or whatever the case may be. Take time to know your child so that you don't compare your child with somebody else. Your child may not be able to speak well, but they can hear very well. They may not be able to run, but they're a very tremendous artist. What is it your child can do that sets them apart? Every person is very special in the eye of God. And as parents, we must be careful not to provoke our children by comparing them with the others. Because they may not say it, they may not demonstrate it, but they will quietly walk away and not say a lot. But before you know it, you've lost your child. Because every time they come around you, all they see, all they hear, all they know, it's a criticism that you're not like this person, you're not like that person. That one cleans up her room. The other one goes when I say go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of our children are slow learners. Some are very responsible. Some will carry out exactly what you said. And some are just the opposite. The key is to know that child for what that child is particularly. Then. Another thing that will cause our children to become aggravated is when we show favoritism to your children. When we show favoritism to our children. James chapter two says, you know, what good is it to have respect for one person and you do not have respect for the other person? Especially those of us who are considered, considered ourselves to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's whom he was talking to. He says, be careful not to show favoritism. Don't tell one person use the back door and the other one you want to have them come to the front door. Don't have a birthday party for one child and then the other child, nothing is happening. You're not even mentioning it. Favoritism in the family can cause problem. You take, for example, what happened between Esau and Jacob. The problem was the mother was favorite to her son. And as a result, it led to many kind of manipulative activities. In one instance, when the father was about to bless the children, the mother even dressed the child up, made him to sound like, look like, appear like his brother, just to receive the blessing from the father. Parents, especially fathers, let's be careful not to show favoritism. And the image that always comes in my mind is when one day we will not be around, 
when these children must live <laughs> with themselves. And what if you're not around and they must remember the days when you were around, how you showed favoritism to this, how you had a special standard for that one and left the others in the dark. Favoritism is one of those things that will cause our children to be aggravated. And lastly for today, what causes our children to become aggravated and angry, believe it or not, is when we break our promises to them. When we promise them and do not carry through with the promise. Paul said here to the Colossians, lie not to one another. When you make a promise and you do not keep the promise, you are actually telling a lie, period. No matter how you slice it, how you dice it, you are telling a lie. And what he is saying here is, when we break our promises to our children, we are lying to them and that aggravates them. And if you know anything about children, they do not forget. They'll remind you 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, they'll remind you of the promise you made and you didn't keep it. Be careful. Aren't you glad we have a savior? Aren't you glad we have a God who is a promise keeping God? Aren't you glad we have a God who said he was going to send a savior and yes, he did it? Aren't you glad we have a God who, as David said, I've been young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken and his seed, now his seed begging bread. Why? Because our God is a promise keeping God. He said before one word of mine uh, fails to accomplish whatever I sent it to, the earth and heaven and earth will be all destroyed. I want to say to you this afternoon, let us be like our heavenly father. Our heavenly father loves us all. No matter what it is that we've done or we haven't done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish. But shall have everlasting life. Let's be like our heavenly father. He doesn't have any favorite. The scripture says God is not a respecter of persons. Anybody, anywhere, anytime. If you choose to walk in his ways. God will show you his love, his mercy, and his grace. And guess what? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Fathers, let's be like our heavenly father. We represent him. Because of us children, we want to know who our heavenly father is. And the way we get there is to be careful, not to provoke our children to anger because provoking them in fact will lead them to be discouraged. We think we're doing well, criticizing them for this, criticizing them for that, criticizing them for the other, when all along, all we are doing is pushing them away. No, let's attract them to us, knowing that when they come around us, they're going to feel some love. They're going to feel something good. The other evening, the supervisor and I were looking at a documentary and in the documentary, was someone that we had come to know, uh, uh, Dr. Brian Stevenson, uh, the gentleman who uh, built the uh, uh, Civil Rights Museum there in uh, Alabama. But he says something interesting about his grandmother. He said whenever he went to visit his grandmother, she will 
hug him so tightly. Sometimes he felt as though his bones were going to break. It was her way of saying, I want you to always feel my love. He said, even on her dying bed, she asked him, Brian, can you feel me squeezing you? He said, yes, grandmother. He said, that's my way of saying to you, I love you. Friends, what are we doing for and to our children that will make them know that we love them? Yes, they made some mistakes. Yes, they've done some wrong things. But when it's all said and done, because they're the image of God, because they're God's masterpiece, because God has a purpose for them, I say to you, together with God, let's lead our children to a better tomorrow. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's be like Jesus. Let's not condemn, but let's show them our love, our grace, our peace, and our mercy. In Jesus' name. Before we turn over back into the hands of uh, Reverend Marie, Many of us that are here today, we will either touch the life of a young man or we are touching the life of a young man even right now. And heretofore, we just thought that if I criticize all of the wrong, they may do the right. That's kind of insane, isn't it? If I criticize all of the wrong, then right will show up. It doesn't happen like that. Paul says, and let's heed to that admonition. He said, do not provoke your children to anger or they'll become discouraged. Let us pray for fathers everywhere. Let's pray for mothers everywhere because in some instances, they are both fathers and mothers that they too will learn not to criticize, not to provoke, but to in fact celebrate and talk about the positive in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we come at this time just to thank you for each person here on this call. We pray God for those who will view this by way of YouTube and Facebook and other social media. God, we pray now for children who've been the victims of criticisms. We pray that somewhere in the process that it will revisit and look at you, how you are a forgiving God and learn to forgive their parents. Then God, I uh, want to pray for parents who all they knew was how they grew up because they grew up with criticism from sun up to sun down. And so they have come to feel and think that's the way to do it. Not realizing in your word, you said, do not provoke children to anger or else they'll become discouraged. So God, we come asking your forgiveness. We're asking that you'll please renew us that with what we have learned today, we'll go forth. And as some would say, accentuate the positive and never ever dwell simply solely on the negative. Bless us now to be a blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You have just watched, Total Connection Worship Hour, with Rev. Dr. Seth O'Lardy, and Mrs. Jacqueline Williams Lardy. We hope you had a great time, and that your life was impacted by the preached Word of God. Please feel free to visit us online at, 
www.sethlardy.org, for more inspirational messages, news, and updates.